So good material. To start with, I want to answer Joel's questions from last week. And then Mark just sent me a bio. And that is perfect to use because it's short and it's so formulaic. Bios are so formulaic that it's interesting to see what can be done with them to, to work within the constraints and yet make it exciting. So, so that, uh, Joel, um, Mark, thank you for that. And I, it's just a great short piece to work with and to see how things can be done. So Joel's question started with um, the difference between popular writing and academic writing. And I mean, the major difference is academic writing is done to a formula. You have your introduction and your, your background. You have your methods. You have your um, findings. You have your, con your, your discussion and your conclusion. Um, and that's just across the board. Um, popular writing begins anywhere. You have to answer the same questions, but you don't have to do it in the same order. And so that opens the way for enormous creativity. Um, and you can begin any place that you think will be interesting. You usually have to know the same information to begin um, because you want to lead with your most enticing, strongest point, And it's knowing the ending um, or the information that'll be at the end, or that's the star of your piece. And you want to entice people into that. So anything is fair game. Um, and you can tell the story when you're writing for the public, there is no formula. formula. You can tell it historically. You could tell it um, through the eyes of a person, a person central to the um, discussion at hand. You could tell it through the eyes of several people. You could tell it um, through the development of ideas, um, a, a certain sequence about what people understood or learned when, depending on the nature of the story. Um, so there's positively no one set way, although every way has to eventually provide all the information and answer the major questions that any intelligent reader would have um, about uh, that article. Um, so how do you move from, how do you move from public writing, how do you move from academic writing to public writing? I don't in a way know how to answer that, except to say, how do you move from talking to your colleagues to having a conversation at a cocktail party. Um, how would you explain what you're doing to your lawyer or your accountant um, or, or a friend or your kids? Um, we all wear different hats and different forms have different um, constraints and possibilities. And you just read enough writing to know, you've read enough to know what the form is for academic writing. I mean, that's been drummed into your head in graduate school. The only way you get to know what the form is for writing for the public is by reading lots of articles and becoming a little bit conscious of how the information is presented. Um, so look at, after you read it, and hopefully how it, the beauty of a really well done article 
is that you're not conscious uh, of the form uh, you're pulled through the story. So I suggest that after after reading something that has pleased you, you kind of go back and look and see and make yourself aware of how it's done. And you keep doing that. Um, so what makes good writers are good readers and there's never been um, any change um, to that formula for moving from academic to um, writing trade, so-called trade writing. Um, dead versus sparkly words, we'll have lots of examples. Um, so I'm gonna take that up and if by the end of the conversation, I haven't satisfied your quest for knowledge about sparkly versus dead words, just keep peppering me with questions. Um, probably the most interesting question, how long does a pitch have to be and what level of detail? I love that question. Um, because it really gets at something very important. Um, I don't think any pitch, except for a book, that's a bit different, but a pitch for an article should never be more than a page and you better kill in your first sentence or intrigue or entice or pull someone in. And the level of detail, I, it's so important that you ask that question because a really superb pitch in one page, you're not going to be able to get into a lot of detail and you shouldn't, but in the course of your pitch, it is extremely wise to get to one or two or three examples of telling um, finely carved detail because that persuades an editor that you're going to be able to tell a story in the level of detail that's needed. So, you know, it's just like when you give a letter of recommendation for someone, you don't just write, oh, she was wonderful and she did everything right. You have to give some detail about this. For example, she did this and uh, this is what it looked like and this is how it came out. You need that same level of detail. It becomes persuasive, convincing that you've mastered the topic that you are proposing to write about. Um, so one or two little gems of detail, um, whether it's about a person, whether it's about how a piece of information developed, I, I really recommend that you devote a couple of sentences um, to um, whittling some prose into some fine detail, because that really, you don't want to do it in the first sentence unless you're trying to captivate you want to do a profile of someone and you want to captivate an editor with um, how well you know or see or understand that person. Um, so do you have an example of that? Of what a good example would be? Um, you know, a, for, on a pitch? Yeah. Like uh, for a detailed sentence that you were talking about. Um, so if you were, if you were, if you were proposing to write a profile of someone, someone interesting, I presume that's why you'd want to write a profile about somebody. Um, if you were proposing to write a profile uh, of someone, you'd want some quirky detail about them, some um, mannerism, some, some reaction 
to something that you can put in one sentence that doesn't take a long time to explain. It requires you to devote a long time to whittling the information into one sentence where each word has to carry a lot of freight. Um, but, but it's worth doing that. And, and that's why pitches really are an art that take um, a fair amount of work and um, you have to have a, a really good global sense of what it is that you want to write about. Although hopefully you will also discover more information in the course of writing the article that you're proposing. You can't, and you can't put and shouldn't put everything in the pitch. But um, some, some quirky detail about someone that becomes relevant to, to the story you want to tell. Um, and you'll see in some of the examples I'm going to show you, you'll see how words that carry detail become persuasive and paint a picture. And that's what you want to do. You want to paint a picture in an editor's mind. And the more you can do that, the more the editor is going to be persuaded to um, commission the article. Um, so do you have to know an editor? Absolutely not. Um, not in the least bit. Um, editors don't commission articles on the basis of friendships unless they also know that the people um, can perform. Um, and if you're, and the way you get into that position is to be a repeat performer. Perform once and an editor is going to listen to you very quickly um, once again. So that's why a pitch has to carry a lot of weight. Um, and, um, and how do you start as a novice? You, you start with a pitch. I can't tell you how many times I've cracked whether it's from the New York Times to Wilson Quarterly, or actually I didn't crack Wilson Quarterly, they, they contacted me, but Smithsonian, um, New York Times, um, tons of magazines um, on, on the strength of a pitch where I didn't really know anybody. Um, because people want good articles and good ideas. And no, you don't have to know anybody, but if you do present a good idea, you will, you will wind up knowing people. Um, you will certainly wind up knowing that editor. Um, so I hope that answers the questions. Um, Yes, no, um, but we have a really great example of editing in action. I want to show you with the bio. I'm going to try and screen share this with you. Um, and I just had two seconds to look at it beforehand, and I want to share it with you. And let's get it here. Okay. So um, take a second to look over the bio. Before you look at the back cover, just look at the bio. And I've highlighted a few things. I've highlighted a few things that... So my cat capture anyone's attention. Bells should go off when there are things that you know are going to capture people's attention because the job of a book cover and bio is the job of a pitch is to capture people's attention. You want people to buy the book, you want people to buy a pitch. So the rules are the same across platforms. Um, 
And what I've done is who would not be fascinated by knowing that someone could track criminals and terrorists um, and pursue them on the dark web um, on the one hand and create online marketplaces on the other. And I highlighted those not because I want to change the bio, I really just want to change the order of the information. Um, and um, so, so the bio might start with something like from tracking criminals and terrorists, you know, or from pursuing criminals and terrorists on the dark web, um, to creating online marketplaces. Um, Mark has uh, spent his career uh, launching and fixing new ventures at startups, Fortune 500s, and academia. Then I'd go back to the beginning. Mark studied at MIT. Um, um, his studies focused on cryptography. Um, and, and then I'd continue on with the same information. I wouldn't change the information. Um, but the idea that he developed the, I, you want to change the language and the rhythm of the language because creating MIT's career success accelerator is a big deal. People pay attention to that. Um, and that's something that, um, that um, I would want to put that piece of information um, before the other part of the sentence. Mark developed, you know, helped develop uh, or start MIT's Career Success Accelerator, you know, the, the 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 name for or the nickname for um, MIT's undergraduate practice opportunities program, um, and I don't think I think it's fascinating with all this professional expertise um, that Mark is also a competitive ballroom dancer. I don't think you need to put the phrase in as a competitive ballroom dancer um, because that detracts then from the next part of the sentence, which is he's the top ranked ballroom dancer. Um, and if it's top ranked, it implies competition. So, so just say, um, and, and, you know, on the side, um, um, besides chasing criminals, um, Mark is a top-ranked ballroom dancer. Um, he lives in New York City and uh, is known for his social gatherings, including his annual Halloween party, to which I want an invitation, by the way. <laughs> Happy to provide it. Oh, thank you. So does that make sense to you, what I've just said? Yeah, I, I should um, note two things, although I think you've picked up on at least one of them. Certainly, uh, the nature of the book, the MIT class is probably the most relevant piece of it. The uh -huh. tracking down terrorists I threw in sounds cool, not really relevant to the book, but obviously makes me a little more interesting. Yes, uh, it's relevant to your expertise. And what you're selling is your expertise. And this, this length bio, we're going to put on uh, an inside, like the back page, sure. inside, as opposed to uh, on the back cover, where I know it would need to be a shorter bio. Right, but people are going to look, who is this guy? Why would I buy his book? You know, you know how you look at books and you want to know who is this person, what credibility uh, does this person have? You, Every step of the way, no matter where the information is, we're not asking you to distort the information. We just, it's just good to order it in a way that captures someone's attention. So starting with a dependent clause, you know, from tracking criminals to 
follow it up with the most mundane element there and including all the others um you know mark has has uh, um spent a career launching and fixing blah 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 so it's just reordering and changing the rhythm of sentences and grabbing people with the information you got to do it on everything you may not even be aware that's what people are doing when when you look at bios in other places because it, all the information is there it's just how it's ordered um and i'm sure you've read bios where by the fourth sentence in you're kind of snoozing off um you know it gets repetitive and routine and ceases being persuasive um you may want the book for other reasons but but it's important to treat every piece of information with the respect and talent that you can muster um and uh i think every piece of information deserves that kind of treatment um now as for what goes on the back cover <clears throat> i mean i'm just looking at it and the things that i've marked in yellow in highlighted or i mean i would just make negotiations negotiating first of all it's active networking negotiating communicating leading career planning um and i wouldn't say these skills i would say these activities are critical to career success but did anyone ever teach the skills to you that's how i would do it um and not much else i would change except that you have the same problem um right at the in your bullet points the last item i would also find a way to make it parallel in construction and the reason you want to do it is parallel construction there is a rhythm and you want to take advantage of that rhythm um and the mind is marking it so if there's a way to um make the statement in terms of managing act you know, managing um and then some noun some interesting exciting noun um rather than effective managing tech techniques um that's the way i would handle that information and mark we could talk about it actually afterwards I, there's very little that i would change here but um that's that would be my top of the head three second assessment um and i hope that makes sense to you this has been extremely helpful yes thank you so much sure it's not even my bio and i found this helpful <laughs> because this holds for all bios this holds why should a bio be boring because a bio is there for purpose it's to provide persuasive credentials to convince the buyer that this person knows what he or she is talking about it's it's a selling point and it should work for you and by the way if you care about how you write the book you should care about how you write the bio it's all of a piece it isn't just oh i could just throw anything down for the bio it's all working on your behalf um it's all demonstrating your wares um so i can get rid of this uh let's see okay and so now i'd like to show you um
a before and after editing. Okay. Um, let's see. How can I get this on the screen? Should play with this beforehand. Let's say. Let's get this. We can see them both. Okay. Good. So. So this is before editing on the left, and this is after editing on the right. Um, let me just get rid of my screen here so I can see it. Um, okay, can you see these fully? Yes. Okay. So, oh wait, let me get this in the same place. Um, so this is the beginning of a piece. Um, let me just get this here. This is the beginning of an article um, that came in pretty good. I was I was very happy to see this. Um, um, so you get a sense of before bronze wheels rattled over Sumerian desert. That first line caught my attention. Um, that's just what you want. Um, because you could picture this. Um, and um, so the writer is setting a scene here. And all I've done really is to beef up that scene. I don't know how, how can I get rid of this? Okay. All right. So, um, so what I did, was, so this is prehistory. So what I did was just to beef up the idea. Before bronze wheels rattled over Sumerian desert and construction began. Um, no, I wanted to emphasize how early in history this was. So I did another before the first stones were chiseled into the great pyramids. Do you see the color and the detail and the sense of work that's being expressed here and, and that's giving people a word picture of what's happening? Um, and you want to get the sense that at this ancient time, before this, before that, people were already brewing beer. And the point of this piece is to show the beer was um, a beer was how how do you say it um, sort of psychic technology you might say fermentation um, uh, was a kind of psychic technology um, fermentation alcoholic fermentation brewing beer um, so. It, that's the point. It's to do it with a certain amount of charm. Um, and, and the whole point is to say that the pyramids were, were built on beer. Um, and they were. I mean, the records, historical records show that the pyramids were, the workers on the pyramids were paid in beer. Um, and all of this is to pave the way for how beer worked psychically to help pave um, uh, civilization and prepare and to, and to ease the way for social life um, and, um, and, and get us where we, and start the wheels rolling to where we are today. Charming is it the world's most essential article? No. But every article has to get treated with dignity. If it's worth running, if it's worth telling people this information, 
if it's worth bringing the information to people, it's worth really doing well. I can't let out of my hands every piece, whether someone sees my signature or not, carries my imprint and I know it's there and I, I, I just can't treat it any other way than to give it its best shot into the world. Um, so my, my delight with this article was to really just beef up and, and throw in words that were a little more colorful, the chiseling, you know, the stones, um, and, uh, and getting those word pictures into, uh, into the article. And that's the difference between deadline and construction began is becomes chiseling stones into the pyramids. Do you understand the difference between dead language and live language there? That's a classic example of ordinary words to words that are immediately having you form a picture of workers sweating away um, in the desert sun, um, getting paid with beer, which must have tasted pretty good, even though it wasn't refrigerator chilled. Um, so that's an example. I this is helpful. I have lots of other examples. And I'm trying to find the short ones for you. Um, so put them all in a file here. Let me just see. Oh, here's another one. Here's another one. Same writer, as it turns out. Um, this is a writer who pitched me cold. And I liked, I liked the beer one, and he pitched me another one, or maybe this one was first, I can't remember. No, wait, I just, oh yeah, that's another good example. Um, oh, here's breakfast. Let's see. Sorry, I should have had these all open on my computer, but I didn't. Um, oh, I just opened the wrong thing again. Sorry, guys. Oh, maybe I didn't. Oh, I probably didn't save it. Okay, here's another one. This, by the way, is by a Renaissance Weekender. Okay, whose name I will not reveal. Um, but a very good writer. Very good thinker. An academic, I might add. Um, okay, so here's how here's how a piece began. Um, on the left, that narrow column, and um, no, not bad. I mean, wouldn't grab me. Um, but he's not just anybody. He's a host of a interesting TV show, and. Um, 
the article was really a good article and a great idea, which was pitched to me by this writer. Um, and the, um, and, uh, and it's about how kitchens are really sort of the last bastion of democracy in a way. They're these crazy places of people um, we're the only thing that and people come in with all kinds of problems and work there and the only thing that matters is whether you can perform on the line and no one cares about your background how many tattoos you have um, what you did yesterday can you cook and can you get it to the table hot um, and and so it's that criterion that makes restaurants really very interesting places with lots of things going on um and so to show that many of the people who work in restaurants are psychologically you know it's a kind of psychological stupor um and um they're heated places in every sense of the word um every once in a while word gets out about fights in the kitchen and among chefs and staffs and i occasionally see things boil over <laughs> into a dining room i don't know about you guys um but I wanted to begin to convey that in in the opening and again repetition but repetition is a way of including inform new information in um so you want to capture someone's interest so he was a, he's the host of bizarre foods that's a point of interest um he's an award-winning chef um and food writer and critic um and you want to get those pieces of information in and and then you have the irony of all this perfection here and this guy was a mess who in his right mind can't relate to that um who of us doesn't think that we have one face you know that we show the world and that behind the scenes not necessarily all the time but sometimes like we're a mess we don't have it together i was in the shower 15 minutes before i was talking to you people um my own little today's mini version of being a mess um so so that's a way of capturing a reader's attention and you can see it's done with changing rhythms so we come down hard on he was a mess it just lands there <laughs> um the rhythm sets you up and it therefore emphasizes it and i believe captures you because i think everybody can relate to that um and uh then how he got into restaurants and how restaurants kitchens are a great place to hide um and that becomes a theme of the article and the article then goes on to um talk about who comes into kitchens what kinds of problems they have there and the movements that are now afoot to actually reform kitchens to bring some measure of attention um to certainly mental health needs um in kitchens and there are a whole lot of efforts and they are described in the article i didn't yeah so things that unilever is doing things that chefs on their own have organized um in around the world um and um 
I just thought that was a really interesting story to tell. You never really hear, everybody goes to restaurants and you never really hear about the kind of mental health melting pot that kitchens are and how they are wonderful places in accepting all kinds of people. Um, and I wanted to get a suggestion of that very quickly into the lead while capturing um, people's attention. Um, so if you could see the difference in the opening sentence to um, from the beginning to the end, uh, to the edited one, um, that should give you an idea of the way words and rhythms and sentence construction is used to highlight a piece of information, to paint a picture in your head of a person. Here, you have all these achievements. Boom, he's a mess. Um, and as I said, we can all relate to that. Does that make sense? Does that? Yeah, that does. It was, it's really clear. It's a nice example. Um, and I have others. Let me just get let me, okay let me close this and i think what else do i want to oh, okay here's oh here's one where so this is on want to get this on a smaller screen so you can see this and it's about ketamine um, and okay as this new, and I should have made the margin smaller so you can see this better, sorry. Okay, so let me see if I can. Um, let me just go down in size here. Is this too small for you to read? It's fine. Okay. And um, so I can make this a little bit smaller too and get it up here. Sorry for taking up all your time with, with fiddling. Um, okay. So, um, so this is an article about ketamine. Um, and it's basically an article about what ketamine can do for depression, also what it can't do for depression. Um, and, um, and, and, and it can do, among the things it can do, it can do something very remarkable, which other drugs can't do and haven't done. And that is it has a very specific effect on um, preventing suicide in curbing suicidal ideation and activation. That's really very important under certain circumstances. And um, 
So the article begins, for decades, the antidepressant arsenal has been limited to variations of the same SSRIs, tricyclics and MAO inhibitors that have dominated depression treatments in the late 80s. Why do you even want to know about that? Well, it doesn't get at what's it's an important point, but it's not presented in an important or in the most relevant way. And the, mo the most relevant piece of information is that we've had these drugs for 30 years, the incidence of depression has soared and nothing new has been presented to treat depression. So you have the, this crisis of depression incidents um, and the therapeutic arsenal just staying still and it's remained unchanged and i deliberately used the word um arsenal um it was used in the original and i kept it um and uh and to point out that the and and but i followed up that sense of an arsenal with these drugs being on active duty for half a century. I mean, if you're going to use a fairly strong word, carry out without stretching it, without pushing it beyond its limits, just carry out the implications. Um, these drugs have been doing heavy duty for a long time, and yet nothing's changed. Um, so um so the point about ketamine is that it's come up from the underground i mean it's a veterinary drug um and it's actually on who's list of important anesthetics but basically it's best known as a club drug um and uh, special k um and uh and i wanted to get that information in and across because there are all these contrasts here. Um, and uh, I just think the differences speak for themselves. Um, that um, I mean, And one of the important points about ketamine that isn't even alluded to um i don't think i don't think it was even alluded to in the original is that so here's this drug it has to be administered intravenously which is not easy and yet all these and it's already approved for use um because it's an anesthetic and as i said World Health Organization regards it as one of the top 50 most important drugs in the world. Um, it's already approved for use just about everywhere. And so it can be prescribed. And yet all these crazy, unregulated clinical centers have been springing up. You go in for your shot of ketamine and uh, it, they are not necessarily restricted these centers don't necessarily restrict incoming patients to those who have suicidal ideation they welcome anyway anyone who's willing to plunk down 500 bucks um and that became the beginning of a big article looking at the pros and cons of ketamine and ketamine used this way. It has lots of very interesting uses, even some that went beyond the scope of this article. Um, and one of its most interesting uses, I think, is that given in regulated ways, it opens people up um, and it facilitates psychotherapy um and and particularly long sessions of psychotherapy that are extremely therapeutic for those who have ptsd 
um, where many other therapies have not worked or take years, decades to work. And ketamine given immediately before a long-term guided session of psychotherapy is proving to be one of the more remarkable treatments for PTSD. Um, and it's because it, it works in this way of opening people up. Um, so that's just an example of, um, of getting information. You don't need information about side effects in a lead. I mean, that just doesn't belong there, which was in the original side effects like weight gain. And you want to get to the point. You want to get to it um, in a way that people care about. Um, so you want to mention, you know, this here it is coming up from the underground of all places, you know, for treating depression and springing up from, you know, this holy other unregulated use into another <laughs> actually quite unregulated use. Um, so that was my point here. And I really have one I, I really am dying to show you because I think this is a much longer article and I'm only showing you the beginning. Um, breakups raw. Okay. So this is an article. I love this article. Um, this is an article about um, breakups edited. Okay. About how breakups are really different beasts today um, than they were. And Okay. Let me get this on your screen. Oh, let me see if I can get this. Um, sorry for all my maneuvering here. I should have had them laid out earlier. Um, okay. Um, so uh, the original article is about a woman, um, this is a true story, it begins with a true story. Um, actually the, the book, the caps that you see here are my notes to the writer as I, as I read the story very often in the course of editing, what I'll do is I'll get a piece in and make no i'll print it out the article i'll make notes on it and then i'll send extensive notes back embedded in the copy to the writer where my questions begin to arise and my note here is how this opening story about mary who was a real woman and i actually spoke to her um, how and why it doesn't work, um, although potentially it could and it should. And if a story doesn't, if you're beginning with an anecdote and the anecdote doesn't sound real, then it invalidates all that follows. 
So this is a classic example where you need persuasive little elements of detail as well as getting at a getting the larger architecture of a relationship, but you also need important little details. It is a very high art to get that balance right. Um, and I don't have an easy formula, but it's something everybody has to work on. Um, so here. Um, uh, here's the edited version. Um, so you want to, what's going to captivate readers interest is not that Mary is a prominent figure in the New Orleans art scene. Remember, this is an article about a relationship. Um, it's important to know that she's a prominent figure in the art scene, but it isn't necessarily the first thing that you want to know. And to me, what was important to know was that she, like probably every other human being who wants to be in a relationship, wants someone they can talk to, in her case, create art with, balance ideas off. I mean, that... I mean, that to me speaks to a universal longing. And in an article about relationships, I want to get to that really, really quickly. And I have it in her own words. Um, and then I tell you, she's a key figure in the arts community. Because then it makes sense that she wants someone to talk art with. Um, and this is her idea of what what a good relationship is. I want us to be each other's critic and support. I want someone I love to dance with. I, it, I don't think you're human if you can't relate to her yearnings. So that's the beginning and she admits it's a tall order. So I think by doing that, I'm hooking the reader because the reader is going to want to know, was the order fulfilled? Did she manage? I, why, is, why am I being told this? How does this relate to, you know, getting what she wants? Um, so what I've done is highlight in the edited version things that were not anywhere in the prior version and they add color they add detail they add specificity um and you can just picture so they were together they broke up and then they reunited and i could say they ran into each other at, at mardi gras but picture mardi gras and people dancing down the streets, which is what people do in Mardi Gras. The music's going, the drinks are, gr are going, and they literally danced into each other at Mardi Gras. And I thought, just with those words, you're giving a little bit of detail. You're getting a picture of something happening, um, and it captivates you. Um, and... Um, I immediately followed that with the gravitational pull of a relationship, which again is something that I think everybody can relate to without, it has enough detail without going into all the details of he, sh he said, she said, he then said, she responded with, we can all relate to what the gravitational pull of a relationship is without articulating the silliness of oh, and some of the details that sound silly to someone outside the relationship. Um, and because this is an article that's about how um, 
the internet and computer and and uh, and relating electronically has changed the way relationships end and cast them into this kind of uh, um, purgatory. They never end. They just sort of go on and people watch each other from afar and you don't know whether someone's interested. It never cuts off your hope of reigniting a relationship if you can't let go of that hope. Um, so I wanted to suggest that this, that the electronic world, which is the reason for telling this story, has changed the way we end relationships, which in turn then changes the way we're prepared to enter into a new relationship, which is extremely important. Um, so I just summed up a lot of information um, about pulling in a little, by pulling in a little computer terminology about boosting the bites of affection. So you get to see how there's this little, you get the sense of little bits of attention on the computer. They may be from a distance, suggest someone's continuing interest, and that can give someone hope that may be false and therefore keep someone attached in a relationship when they should be emotionally detaching from a relationship. And, and again, I just used a variety of terms about the long half-life of digital attention uh, from a distance and, and how someone hangs on to hope and um, purges someone from her psyche, purge, it's a strong word. You have to purge someone from your psyche, at least for a while, in order to end a relationship and then enter into a new relationship. It's really hard to get into a new relationship if you're, you know, still have half your hopes on an old relationship. And, and those are the words that I've highlighted here. These are words that Paint pictures in your mind are relevant to the article. So they're kind of terminology that does double duty. They're drawn from a specific lexicon, a digital lexicon, um, which is relevant to this article to help convey um, how people continue to orbit each other when they should be emotionally moving on. Connected by keystroke, they linger electronically. Pale signals of noticing. And just think about it. I mean, almost ridiculous how pale signals can get. Um, but it's a, it's a pale signal. We can all imagine a pale signal. Um, and so we talk about, um, um, sort of the iterations of interest that happen via computer. So it's the selection of terminology that makes it very specific to the domain that this article is relating to. Um, I hope that gives you another sense of how terminology can get very specific and detailed and colorful and help boost you um, and boost your interest uh, um, in a piece that that shows how the technology how technology has changed a very important facet um, of relationships so every little bit every word has to work in a way, and why not choose, why not play with the terminology from the digital world? Um, so there, I mean, I could go on and on in this article. Um, yeah, so the whole point of the article is right here. It's like ambiguity is becoming the new norm in relationships because of these 
just ways of hanging on electronically to each other. Um, and then, of course, I ended the beginning of the article with the great irony of, so here we have a whole generation of young people that's pushing to banish ambiguity from sexual relationships, and yet they're cultivating it um, online. I mean, it, it was, to me, it was just too good an irony to, to let drop. Um, and then I brought in a, no, um, a Nobelist um, for validation of the phenomenon about why endings are so important, why they are so critically, emotionally, uh, cognitively important. And I brought in Danny Kahneman's uh, research on cognitive distortions, this particular one being the um, peak ending rule that how we remember an experience is not that we give equal weight to what happens over time in a relationship, but we give particular weight to the highest, most exciting moment of a relationship, and of course, to the ending. And that colors our entire memory of the experience, no matter how long the experience was. So please don't have a bad divorce. Um, because that'll cover color forever your view of what could have been before that a decent relationship. Anyway, so so it's bringing some intellectual significance to a topic that I didn't want anyone to think was trivial, because how how relationships end is exceedingly important in our social life. And endings are really very significant in our cognitive system and bias a lot of other mental information that we have. Get it? Yeah, this was really helpful for me. Um, you know, it shows the art form in writing and that there isn't just a list or a how-to that you can follow to do it. You really have to internalize what you're writing. And like you also just said, you know, remove a lot of the biases that you have. Uh, and, and I now see some of the sparkly examples. I hope you can give us more next week also. I'm loving this. Oh, yeah. Um, I've probably gone way over time, right? A little bit. Okay. okay so, yeah, I do have more and I can keep giving more. Um, there was one I really wanted to show you, but I, I somehow had the, the before, but I didn't have the after. And I'll make sure I have that for next time because I think it's one of the, um, one of the clear ones of uh, how prose work and why editors edit. So. I, I also really hope we can have, I thought that Mark's bio was really helpful today. I really got to see. Yeah, I do. Uh, how to I take, saw yeah, that. that was, I thought it was great because it's short and it shows you this thing that we all look at all the time and we think is so formulaic. You could make it dance. You could make it sing to people. You can make it persuade people. Yeah, I hope that others will share bios and other short pitches and things because th that was really helpful. Just a few, uh, just a way of moving things around and changing a few words really did make it pretty dynamic and highlighted, you know, some of the things that I think could have gotten lost in there uh, that are really big accomplishments. So, and that's what we're all looking for. So anyway, I, I found that to be very helpful. Thank you. Would it not not to keep people longer? I have uh, I took all your advice, and while we we're doing the webinar, I made a few changes. I don't know if it would be interesting to see the the final version, or if people need to go and and do other things. I I'd like to, but I don't know if Hara has the time. Yeah, no. I this is the highlight of my week. Actually, my weeks are unbelievably stuffed, and I love doing this. And I love you guys. You know, it's fun. It's instructive for me. It helps me articulate what I do and why I do it. So yeah, 
Um, I, um, do you I, want to share your screen, Mark? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let me do that. While he's doing that, I just want to say hi. I came in late. Uh, Dwayne, I, I know I owe you a response. This has been one of many weeks from hell. And I put a lot of things on the side. I flagged them to pay attention to. And, you know. Don't, don't worry about it. I've, I've had a really good time just sitting on the couch these last couple of weeks. Oh, good. Okay. So um, I would say that half my life is devoted to finding two things. One is toilet paper. And by the way, I got a shipment of five rolls of toilet paper this week. So I'm like one happy camper. And, um, and, and Mrs. Meyer's dish liquid, which twice Amazon has canceled my order at the moment of supposed delivery. And it's like, it just consumes vast amounts of time to have to track down and find alternate sources of this stuff. The travails of an editor. Yeah, right, exactly. Okay, I, so screen I, share. Yeah, I, I don't know why um, I switched laptops recently. and this Okay, is shoot it to me and I'll put it on screen share. You, you should have it in your email already, please. Okay, you sent it to me in my email. I'll just quickly, okay. Oh, wait, I can just, I can um, put the email up on screen share. Um, uh, let me do this here. And go back to screen share. Um, wait a minute, how do I do this? Um, just hit share content and then <clears throat> you I'll have to go up. back to my zoom screen here it is i'm sorry yeah oh, i think i just got the share working oh okay great okay all right is everyone able to see that yep yep yeah so let's um Yeah, and you know, and the rhythm changes from the first sentence to the second sentence, which is what you want. You want to push someone through your bio. Um, um, what, what you didn't say is that you're a graduate of MIT. Uh, I, I took, I cut some words, so I did a, at MIT he received. Oh, 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 okay. Um, I would move that up to after the career success accelerator sentence and just because you, you get your BS before you get to Harvard B school. Oh, I didn't attend Harvard business school though. I worked there. Did you work there before you got your BS at MIT? Uh, no, worked there afterwards. Um, this is, yeah, it's not quite in reverse chronological order. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I had looked at and thought we went from the big, you know, I did all these things and then threw it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, Mark. It was just that I would have, I just would have thought there was a continuity of MIT, you know, and say MIT is where Mark got you know, received his BS in physics and, you know, a master of uh, engineering computer science focusing on cryptography, which, by the way, I think is just a really interesting piece of information. Um, um, I, it just seems to me naturally to come in there. I wouldn't even change a sentence, you know, really. Um, just the reorder, okay? Yeah. And then I would say then at Harvard Business School, you know, Mark worked with, um, just to give some sequence there. Um, 
Joel and I both agree with uh, the re re uh, positioning it. Yeah. Right. And Joel, Joel mentioned you could say after graduation. Sorry, we're we're all interrupting, but we're we're all on board with this. This is a kind of cool. Yeah. Um. So you're no longer a top ranked ballroom dancer. No, I don't. I don't compete anymore. It's been a number of years. But I figured throw that in because that also sounds unique and kind of cool. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. It shows your breadth of activity. I mean, it, it makes an irresistible package. Okay? So it shows you not to be one dimensional, that you can, you know, you, you can have a graduate degree from MIT and be a top ranked ballroom dancer. No, I, it's definitely important information not to be cut um and 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 having the social side i mean mark this re this all of the information presents a very appealing picture of a human being whoever picks up the book okay you never know who will pick up the book so i think it's all really important okay and just adds to the charm <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate all the uh, the input and feedback. Good. I'm so yeah, yeah. Um, I want to read the book now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now we. Now all we need is the book. So hopefully, hopefully June at this point. <laughs> all right. Right. You're you're sort of going by whatever's going to happen out there in the world, of course. Yeah, I, ju I have a meeting this week to discuss my edits. Uh, they, sh they did the interior layout. I've got to give them my feedback. We're running through it this week. We've got the bio, the back cover that I'm giving them, the front covers. We're doing a final few tweaks. Uh, <laughs> friends of mine on Facebook will see me post a few variants of that to get feedback. And we should be ready to go to the printing press within a few weeks if printing presses can actually run these days. Um, yeah, I, they are, um, and because printing presses can pretty much operate with social distancing. Joel, Joel wants to know who your publisher is. I wound up, uh, I'm self-publishing and I hired a company in Michigan to do it. Um, it's been a little mix so far. And there, I spent a lot of time thinking about whether it made sense to self-publish or go with a traditional publisher. And after a lot of investigation and calculations, decided self-publishing was the right fit for me. That's a topic for a whole other discussion we can have um, uh, on a future Sunday. That would probably be a really good one. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, if you want to do that next week, that would be a good topic. Um, okay. And anyone who wants to shoot questions to me during the week, um, please do. And I'll, um, with any luck, I'll get to see them 10 minutes before. Um, I, I hope to have more time next week. It was particularly rushed this week. But yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for being there, everyone, and providing such uh, good material to work with.